Chapter 7 Bright lights glared down at her. There must be a hundred people or so in the audience. Paget nervously fiddled with her jacket. She had bought a second-hand suit set at the thrift store and paired it with a nice blouse. She looked professional, except the butterflies were starting up a storm in her stomach. She pressed a hand to her abdomen and watched from behind the curtain as people found their seats. Tonight's debate was her first, and she tried to review all the facts that she had learned over the past week, but they were gone. It didn't matter how many people were reported as homeless in the city, or how much the city budget was and where it was spent. There was nothing in her brain but fear. The butterflies picked up momentum. She was worried that they might fly away with her. She idly wondered if she should have smeared Vaseline on her teeth like a professional dancer did, so that she would be sure to smile for the whole debate. Did politicians do that? Smile through everything? The moderator stepped up to the stage, announcing the candidates, the rules of the debate, and generally welcoming the audience. Paget could feel the fear ratchet up a notch. Mayor Johns came to stand beside her and gave a jolly laugh. I love a good debate. Paget murmured something. She did not like a good debate. Not when a hundred people were watching her and judging her. She barely glanced over at Tom Bailey. A city councillor and late entry into the mayoral campaign joined them. They were announced to the stage. Paget stepped forward into the light and was blinded for a moment. Her feet skidded to a stop. She couldn't see. Mayor Johns bumped her from behind and she stumbled forward awkwardly. Flushing red, she forgot to shake hands with her two opponents and rushed to her podium. Tom Bailey came over to her and shook her hand anyways. He gave her a smile. First debate, Mrs. Williams? Paget nodded, mortified. I had a smear of butterscotch pudding on my forehead for my first debate, thanks to my son. Everyone called me a lot of poop names in the paper and online. However, it was memorable, and I won a seat as counselor. He put a comforting hand on her shoulder. Take a deep breath. You'll do fine. Paget smiled up at him in relief. Thank you. Bailey went to his podium, and John smiled evilly at her, happy that she was already messed up and the debate hadn't even begun. The moderator asked them to introduce themselves. Mayor Johns was a husband, father, and grandfather of eight. He had been mayor of the city for two consecutive terms and was looking for a third. He had a proven track record and hoped the good citizens would remember his dedication to them. Mayor Johns told his background with a jolly laugh that he was so well known for. He also enjoyed playing Santa Claus for the little ones each Christmas at City Hall. He sounded like a wonderful man. Too bad he wasn't, Paget reflected. Councillor Tom Bailey was a husband, father of two, and an experienced council member. He talked about how he enjoyed being a protective member of the city council and wanted to make a difference in the community. He had chosen to run against Mayor Johns because he felt that some of the mayor's policies would not be beneficial to the citizens of the city. He believed that the city had a bright future and wanted to be part of ushering it in. He supported numerous charities. When it was her turn, Paget smiled and began tentatively. My name is Paget Williams. I'm a student at the local college studying my passion, which is journalism and broadcasting. I have no children, but there is an amazing man in my life named Max. Max has been my inspiration for doing this. He has helped so many in our community out of his own goodwill, and I hope to help the citizens by his example. I don't have the experience that my fellow candidates do. I'm a bit of a klutz, as you've already noticed. Yet I do want to help our city and all the citizens in it, not just those that are deemed worthy by Mayor Johns. Thank you. The moderator thanked them all, and they began to discuss their platforms. After that, it was time for the questions. There were some questions from the audience, so Paget had no time to prepare for them. She felt underqualified and ignorant. Her nerves were stretching thin. She knew Max, Adam, and Dix, and a few others were in the audience, and she wanted to do well. As people began lining up to the microphone to ask their questions, Paget was surprised to see people she knew. Her friends, students from her classes, students had been helping with her campaign, some customers from the diner, they were all hogging the two microphones so that no one else could get a question in. She was overwhelmed as they asked questions. Some gave Bailey intelligent questions. Many gave Mayor Johns a difficult and angry questions about his stance on the homeless in the city. 
The rest gave her easy questions, questions that she knew from the practice debate that Mrs. Brown had allowed her to hold to help polish her skills. Paget couldn't believe how many people were rallying around her, making her first debate a wonderful experience. Suddenly she was just talking to people she knew, telling them answers that came from her heart. The butterflies went away, and she felt that she was really shining. Then it was all over. The candidates shook hands, Mayor John's angry but determinedly jolly, Tom Bailey a gentleman as ever. Paget just relieved that she hadn't entirely embarrassed herself or the college. Some of them greeted people, and it wasn't long before Paget was surrounded by her friends and well-wishers. "'I vote we go to Barney's to celebrate,' Adam said excitedly. "'You did an amazing job, Paget. Paget grinned. "'I had a lot of help. Thank you.' Dick shrugged. "'It was fun to stick to Mayor John's. I should help organize protests.' "'This was your idea?' Paget couldn't believe so many people had come out to help her and make her first debate a memorable event. "'I had some help in the execution,' Dix allowed. "'She wanted to just egg him. "'But we convinced her this way would be better,' Adam grinned as Dix elbowed him. "'Hey, no one has cash to bail you out of jail.' "'That's right,' Max agreed as he threaded his fingers through Paget's to hold her hand. "'We're all broke.' "'So to Barney's, where there is cheap beer and cheap nachos?' Paget asked. The group agreed and split a cab, since it was a special occasion. Once at the bar, they managed to snag a table at the back. Max went for the usual run of orders. Paget took off the suit jacket and popped off her shoes happily. "'Have you returned the application for Mare yet?' Dix asked. She knew that Paget had been holding off on it, delaying. "'I thought I'd procrastinate until the last possible minute,' Paget sighed. "'At first, during tonight's debate, I thought it would be a good thing if I dropped out. Mr. Bailey seems like a really good candidate, and I'd want to split the vote making Mayor Johns get elected again. Plus, when I stumbled, I just thought I couldn't do it. I couldn't go through any more debates. Then everyone came through for me and asked those questions, the really easy ones for me that I'd had practice with. It shows how many people are supporting me and want me to do this. I can't let them down, Paget fiddled with a coaster. I'll finish the application and get it in before the deadline. I can't believe so many people believe in me. Why wouldn't we believe in you? Adam asked, puzzled. I suppose I've had so many years where people didn't believe in me that I'm surprised that people do now, Paget shrugged. Dix grabbed her hand and gave it a squeeze. Well, we believe in you and we want you to go for it. You're amazing, Paget, and we're happy that you're our friend. Totally, Adam agreed after Dix elbowed him. Max came with their orders, and the group happily chatted about how much they had managed to irritate the current mayor. The next evening, Paget looked at the pile of papers she was surrounded by. There was the application that she was nearly finished that had to be done tonight. There were questions for the next debate that she was supposed to prepare to answer. This is crazy. I'll never learn it all. When I go on stage, it all flies out of my head anyways. You don't need to. You only need to know the basics of everything and the direction you want to go in on the issues. Focus on the positive directions to get people to follow you. Max took another slice of pizza, his eyes not straying from the game. Focus on ten things to learn about. Be an expert on four of those things for your campaign. How do I get to be an expert on homelessness and what the city does to help people living out on the streets? Paget asked. She felt entirely overwhelmed. Max thought for a moment. You could live outside for a while, use the amenities and experience it for yourself. Or I could utilize the expert that I have already sitting beside me, she smiled prettily at Max, hoping he'd take the hint. What do you mean? Max asked, his attention fully hers now. You know I'll help you out. Really? Of course. I wouldn't offer if I didn't mean it. "'What do you say to be my running mate?' Paget asked. Max laughed. "'There's no vice-mayoral position. It's not how it works.' "'There are counselor positions,' she countered. "'You could run for one. The application process doesn't close until midnight. You could still do it. And I could really use your help. It would be so nice to have someone else at City Hall who knows the issues and is a friendly face.' Max slung an arm around Patrick's shoulders and gave her a gentle squeeze, leaning his head against hers. 
That's a cool thought, but didn't you say that you had to fill in out all sorts of forms online, including an address, which I don't have? Oh, Paget felt defeated. Here was an opportunity for him, one she was certain he would be great at, and he was disqualified just because he didn't have an address. Then, as usual, her mouth spoke before her brain could think. Move in. What? Their eyes met, and for a moment they were both speechless from her blurted-out words. Move in, she repeated softly. I need a roommate, and you need an address. Then you could run for counselor. For a moment he looked a little disappointed before turning his attention back to the game. What? I think you'd be great on city council. You know the issues. You've talked me through so much of it already. You volunteered to summarize all of this for me. You're smart. You care. You're charming. I... I think you could do it. You think I could, he asked, a little bit hurt. I know you could, Paget replied. She did believe that he could. Max was amazing. He already knew more about this sort of thing than she did, and she was the run running for the position. That's the only reason you want me to move in? he asked quietly. Paget wondered how she was supposed to answer the question like that, especially when her brain hadn't been functioning when her mouth offered. I suppose... I mean, it would help you out, and you wouldn't be on the streets any more. Plus, I like you as a person, and I trust you in my home. And it would be a really good chance for you to turn your life around. Is there something wrong with my life? he questioned. No, Paget protested. I didn't say that. I just mean that having an address could open up a lot of opportunities for you. You said it yourself. If you don't have an address, you can't apply for this or other programs and stuff. Am I just a project of yours? Get a homeless guy off the street? His voice had a bit of an edge to it. Definitely not, Paget said defensively. I wouldn't offer just anyone access to my home. I believe in you, and this would solve the address problem. You think I couldn't get an address of my own? Max pulled his arm back, and suddenly she felt bereft, like she had lost something and was on the precipice of losing even more. What? When did I say that? Paget asked in confusion. She couldn't believe he was getting mad about this. It was just common sense. It wasn't like anyone could just put no address on a resume or other important documents. I could do it, you know. Get a higher paying job and join the rat race again. Be the man. I've done it before. Max stood up. I used to own a home, have an exorbitant income, have a fast car and a fast life. I wasn't born homeless. No one said you were. Paget stood as well, muddled about how things had suddenly turned around. Max, why are you mad? I'm not mad, Max practically shouted, backing away from her. Then why are you yelling? She shouted back, following him, but she knocked into the coffee table, jostling the papers and what was left of the pizza box onto the floor. In a last-ditch effort, Paget tried to avoid stepping on the pizza, but slipped on the papers. Her arms windmilled as her foot flew forward, and gravity pulled her backward. With an oomph, she landed on the couch. There was a moment of silence. Max's shaking shoulders gave him away. Don't you dare! Paget pointed a finger at him accusingly before he burst into laughter. You should have seen yourself. He could barely get the words out as he held onto his side and wiped his eyes with his other hand. With a sigh, he looked down at her as Paget stared crossly up at him. He held out a hand, and grudgingly, Paget let him pull her to her feet. He then coaxed her into a hug. "'Why are we yelling?' Paget asked. At the same time Paget spoke, so did Max, saying, "'This is why I love you.' Paget froze. "'Say what?' Max's heartbeat was steady in her ear. Slowly, she pulled back to look up at him. Her mouth went to speak, but Max firmly put a finger against her lips, which was probably a good thing, because her brain was not functioning after such a loaded statement. "'Before you ruin it.' Max said softly. Paget's eyes narrowed. Before she ruined it? What sort of thing was that to say? She opened her mouth, but this time Max replaced her finger with his lips, and Paget forgot all about what she was going to say. It had been a while since she'd been kissed like this, with desire, and Gary was no comparison. This was a toe-curling, belly-clenching, lightning-filled set of kisses. Have mercy. Max slowly lifted his head with a self-satisfied smile. Paget tried to find her dignity back and untangle herself from him. He was far too sure of himself. 
Paget opened her mouth to say so, but once again a finger found its way to guard her mouth. I'll see you tomorrow. Move the finger, or I bite it. Paget waited for him to comply. Tomorrow? Trisha's wedding? Max lifted an eyebrow, and it was obvious that he thought he was such a good kisser that he'd erased the event from her mind. Ego. Paget closed her eyes. That. She was dreading returning, poor and pitied by family, former friends, and country club associates. Everyone would be sugary sweet while gossiping the moment her back was turned. Paget also had that dress in her closet, which was the worst idea that she had in a long time. But what could she do? It was name-brand or not bother going. The event itself was going to cost her well over a hundred grand, and one did not show up at a niece's wedding wearing Salvation Army, even if it was what she needed to wear the rest of the year, maybe even for her life. Bad enough she was renting jewelry. Hey, if you don't want me to go, Max trailed off uncertainly, probably thinking Paget was regretting inviting him. Homeless guy, Paget thought. What was she doing bringing a homeless guy? What was he going to wear? Could her credit card stretch that far? Don't you dare bail on me, Paget pointed a finger at him, much like her mother did at her father when she wasn't getting what she wanted. I need moral support. Then you've got it in spades. Max's smile was back, full force. Pick you up at four? Three. You need to be here at three. The family dinner is at five, followed by torture with cocktails at eight for friends, she said. Paget grabbed his sleeve, suddenly conscious that she was likely going to have to rent a suit for him. They would need time to do that. Maybe two would be better. Max kissed her on the forehead. Three will be fine. It's going to be great. You'll see. Glad well, somebody has confidence, Paget muttered as he left the apartment. She ignored the mess in the living room area and walked to her bedroom. Laid across the bed was the not at most expensive dress she had ever worn. Paget had sold all her other clothes at a consignment shop to get the deposit for this apartment. And food. And bus fare. Plus whatever other essentials she could get, including a computer and printer for school. She wished she had held back one or three dresses, but then she hadn't thought of Trisha's impending nuptials. She had been more worried about being homeless at the time. Now Paget had this dress, plus two more in the closet picked out just for this weekend. None of them were up to the standards her former life expected, but they were all that she could afford. Truth was, she couldn't afford it at all. Nor the jewelry, nor the shoes, or the trip to the hairdresser on tomorrow's agenda. But what was the girl to do? With a sigh, Paget popped down onto the bed beside the dress. For sure she was having a Cinderella moment, only it was a lot more expensive since she had no fairy godmother. Not only that, but how was she going to change her handsome, homeless frog into an acceptable prince for the posh and snotty society they would be encountering on the weekend? Maybe she should call it a reverse Cinderella moment. He loves me. The thought pushed unbidden into her head. He couldn't. They barely even knew each other. He couldn't, could he? He said he loves me. Maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. Just something he felt comfortable saying. There were all sorts of levels of love. Maybe what he really meant was that he liked her, loved her in a friendly, you're cute sort of way, warm and fuzzy, but not love you forever sort of way. Like she liked him, sort of. Why was she disappointed with that idea? Why was she lying to herself? She knew that she liked him a great deal. Maybe was edging closer to the word love every day. He couldn't really love her, could he? It had to be somewhat romantic, she reasoned since he had a habit of kissing her and calling her his girl. Boy, what a kiss. Even now her belly clenched just remembering it. He would be so much better in bed than Gary. You don't know that. It's just a kiss, Paget berated herself and got up. She had an application for the post of mayor to finish before midnight. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.